Welcome to the Parenting with Impact podcast with your hosts, Elaine Taylor-Klaus and Diane Dempster, co-creators of ImpactParents.com, an online community, award-winning blog, and service organization, helping parents all over the world to raise complex kids become capable, independent adults. Hi, everyone. Elaine and Diane here. And we know that you want your complex kids to grow up to be happy and independent. And yet you're not always sure how or when to help with that. In this podcast, we'll encourage you to collaborate with all kinds of complex kids and support them in navigating life and learning. And we'll interview leading experts from around the world, as well as parents in our own community, talking about how training for parents actually helps these complex kids. We'll talk about the issues we hear parents struggling with all the time and how a coach approach can support and empower your amazing young people. We won't tell you what to do. We're going to help you figure out how. So let's move on to the next conversation. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another conversation in the Parenting with Impact podcast. You have Diane and Elaine here for for another fabulous, scintillating conversation. It's the Diane and Elaine show. (laughs) It's not really. We have this amazing team behind us and all these fabulous coaches. And yet sometimes it does kind of look like the Diane and Elaine show, but that's that's only because we've been doing this longer than anybody else. <laughs> so the the topic today, we want to talk about motivation and because like, As you know, that's so fun. Love, motivation is a fun t- conversation. And so many parents will start with my kid's just not motivated Ugh, or get my kid mo- motivated to fill in the or, board. Or I talked to, I talked to a mom this morning and she was like, I don't want to bribe my kid. Oh, yeah. sort of, that's a whole other thing, but there's so many different pieces here about motivation. We want well, to dispel some of the myths and talk about what's really going on underneath it before we get to problem solving. We get to problem I promise we'll give you a, a, actually, you know, in the, in a previous episode, we were talking about not getting stuck in information land. There is a really good tool here for you to use. So we promise we're coming back to it, but we want to set the stage first. Yes. And wait, what was it you just said? A mom who said, I don't want to bribe my kid. Right. So there's motivation is fraught, right? Because somehow we, we, we believe it has to do with will and intention. And it's really easy to take it personally. If our kids aren't motivated, there is something about feeling like a kid's unmotivated that has us, that brings, I think, a lot of fear for a lot of us. There's, what if they're lazy? Well, what if they're never going to get themselves together? What if there's a lot of underlying fear that we don't really talk about it when we're worried about a kid who doesn't seem motivated? Well, and the reality is that as grownups, as grownups, mm-hmm. grownups are more likely to have what they call intrinsic motivation, which is this sort of, I do it because I want to do it or because it feels like the right thing or it's aligned with my values or, you know, it's like, and and as adults, even intrinsic motivation isn't always enough for adults. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And it's something you get when you're a grown up, And so our kids don't naturally have yet. They haven't, co- they're not developmentally ready. Right. Have, exactly. And you have complex kids, so it's going to take, longer. So that's the first myth. Number one is these kids aren't going to just want to do it because it's the right thing to do. (laughs) And it doesn't mean that they're immoral or don't have values. Right. right? Let's be honest. A lot of us now, Diane and I are different because we love what we do, but a lot of people go to work for the extrinsic motivation of getting paid. Right. right. Like you're not intrinsically going to work because there's a value of it's important to work. You're going because you're earning a paycheck and you're trying to support your family. So there's another value that's being honored. Right. And that happens a lot, I think, as adults. So so we really want to look at this notion. So myth number one is our kids are not immoral. And it's not a moral failure if they are struggling with access to motivation. Right. Myth number two is that they that I heard in what you just said is that our kids should be as if they're ready because they're a certain age. And very, very often developmentally, our kids are not quite ready for that level of, of independent motivation that Diane was well, talking about. OK, so then the third myth I want to talk about is that that our kids shouldn't need to be motivated. Ah, to yes. Done. Yeah. Like, yeah. I shouldn't have to put in an external motivator to help them get it done, which is kind of the flip side of it. So well, talk about motivation, particularly with the kids with executive function challenges. Well, I think it ties into that, that like if we have a very strong value around a strong work ethic, 
or we have a value around like carrying your load, carrying your weight or doing the right thing. Like if we as an adult have a well-developed value around something, if we don't see our kids reflecting that value, again, we become afraid that that means they're somehow depraved. And the truth is, they may have different values. That doesn't mean they don't care for people and aren't morally good people. But, you know, I have a value around efficiency, for example. I like to do things really efficiently, get it done, get it done well. I don't like to waste a lot of time. My son also has a value around efficiency, but it looks really different. It looked really different for a teenage boy than it did for me. Because mm-hmm. his the way it expressed for him was like, you guys all work too hard. Why are you doing that? You oh, yeah, mine, mine is... Way. Well, and and it's this value of ease. Yes, value of it. So if I'm where I'm weighing value of ease versus value of efficiency. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we're down on the rabbit hole. The, I think your bottom line is that just because they don't yet have those intrinsic values that we have doesn't or mean they, they won't eventually get them. Or they may have different values that they're honoring. And when we get really clear about what's important to them to them because they are separate autonomous human beings, we can help motivate them based on what's important to them. That's not what's important to us. And I think that's another thing that we often do as parents, a a gap we fall into is we try to motivate them based on what would motivate us. Yeah. I think it's important. I want to get it done. I think I, the way I work, I would get it done first. So then I get the reward. So we think they should, we should do do it it the way we do. We should do it the same way because that's what works for us. So that's another sort of fallacy in that world of motivation is if it works for one person, maybe with ADD or executive function, it's going to work for everybody. Well, and I think, so then the other thing I want to talk about is just how critical having motivation is mm. to get the the brain to do anything. And this is true for everyone, but especially for people with ADHD or executive function challenges, there really does need to be there. There absolutely has to be a motivation there. And if the motivation isn't there or the motivation is stronger to do something else, it's going to be virtually impossible to get them to act or take action without some sort of motivation in place. So one of the things Jeff Copper talks about, so Jeff Copper does attention talk radio and he and I like to spend a lot of time um, navel gazing about attention and focus and action and managing these issues. One of the things he talks about is that it's not that, you know, when we look at our kid and we say he's not motivated, she's not motivated. It's actually not true. They are highly motivated to be doing or not doing exactly what they're doing or not doing. They're just not motivated to do what it is we want them to do or we think they should do or what they're even responsible for doing. But that's not they they are. My kid was highly motivated to play video games as an escape because the homework was overwhelming and they were freaked out. My kid was was highly motivated to talk to their friend late at night to help their friend because that seemed way more important than getting their homework done. So it's not that they're not motivated. They're just motivated to something else. And so we need to to create a balance of motivation. So we have to like, so the motivation is at this level over here, we've got to figure out how to raise the motivation for the thing that we want or that we think is important for them. Right. right. Or that they're responsible for that will serve them. You know, I think about when you're talking about teenage kids and you start moving towards that college application process, we want it because they want it. We know they want to go to college. You know, if you've got a kid who happens to want to go in that path and yet parents get all stuck in, well, they've got to do this. And we get stuck in, in the, it's important to do it instead of remembering the motivation to them and help them connect into the motivation. Right. And I know we're not going to talk about agenda. No, no. And I was, there, but, there's a couple of different directions I want to go with that. So one is just a quick reminder that the motivation has to be like time sensitive. Relevant. Yeah. My kid, my kid is in 10th grade and he wants to be able to go to college. It's not going to be motivating for him to focus on, well, you want to go to college, you should do your homework in 10th grade. He needs something more time sensitive. A little more immediate. Yeah. The, other, the other piece that I want to spend a little bit more time talking about is that motivation isn't enough, right? It's a sort of just, again, this is what we were talking about earlier, just because they say that they want it, if they're still not doing it, right? They sign the piece of paper that says, yes, I will do this. I agree to follow through on X, Y, Z, and I'm going to limit my screens. Don't assume that if the behavior doesn't change, that it's because they were 
feeding us some BS about being motivated or bought in because the reality is they may not have the executive function to actually execute what it is that they commit to. And we talked about this in the last episode that we did about what were we talking about? We were Um, talking about, um, Ah, we were talking about information. Not oh, yeah, enough. not getting stuck in information land. And we talked about the example of of my son taking out the trash. Right, he didn't have the executive function to remember when it was Monday night, but he did have the executive function to independently get himself up, get out, and get the trash done. Right, and he could do it well. He st- still needed me to scaffold the reminder as we worked towards him coming up with a system that, that kept me out of it. But I had to be part of that system for a long time. Well, and the, the analogy I always use is like, you could offer me a million dollars to teach, to speak French. Uh, but if I don't have the skill set and I've never taken a French class or my brain isn't in French land, it doesn't matter how much money you offer me. You've got, it, it takes motivation and executive function. And so if you've put a motivation in place, whether it's a concept, like I, I have parents all the time. It's like, I took away everything. I've got nothing left to take away. Uh, well, those, the, those the calls, chances right? are the problem is not motivation. Chances are right. the problem is something else. Probably likely it's about executive function and, and control. kids need support <laughs> and accommodation and not just motivation. And, and that's the problem. We see the problem. We want to put motivation on either a, a reward or a consequence. And if the reward or the consequence isn't working, you want to dig deeper and go, okay, what's really going on here? Right. So let's, we, we promised you a strategy. We're going to teach you, is, are we ready to go into pinch? We can. Okay. So we have a concept that we teach that we have borrowed and tweaked and cultivated over the years and parents love it and other professionals love it. And we get positive feedback all the time. And there's a really good website article on the website about it as well. So the acronym that we teach to help you find motivators for your kids, but let me say that differently, to help your kids find motivation for themselves. Oh, that's another thing. Let's talk about that when we're done with pinch. Okay. Well, you want to talk about it first? Okay. We, yeah, let's do that. We yeah, we're going to a little bit. Yeah. So the other piece of this is helping kids understand the role of motivation. And the story I love to tell, my, my kiddo was like in second grade working on math problems and it was one of those sort of taking two hours to do something that would take 20 minutes that should take like 10 or 15 minutes to do. And we divided the homework over two nights, night number one, he got it done in 10 minutes, night number two, it took, I kid you not two and a half hours to do the same number of problems. And it was just, for me, it was mind numbing and I'm banging my head against the wall and it's exhausting. And so (laughs) rinse and repeat, we sat down after we finally got through the two and a half hours. And I said, Dude, what's up? What was what happened? What, what, so happened? What, worked, what worked was you were committed to do it, right? She went through the yeah. process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what, what was, didn't yeah. work? So what didn't work? He's like, my show was on the first night. Mm. And so he was really excited to get it done. Because there used to be this so, thing so called I appointment could, television. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It's great. But but it was in, it enabled me to teach him about the role of motivation. Wow. Your brain was really motivated to get that stun, stuff done quicker the first night. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I wonder what are some of the things that might motivate your brain? Again, it's just sort of, it makes it about his brain needing motivation rather than him needing motivation, which for my kiddo. And I think a lot of our kids, it's just sort of, if it's about their brain needing to be motivated and not about, them themselves. I think it's it, that third person piece of it often helps. But then I was able to engage him in a conversation about what motivates him. And so for the next, this is second grade, remember, but it was like, okay, I'm going to give myself a bowl of ice cream after my homework because it'll help me to, to motivate, help my, my brain to be motivated to get my homework done because I know that there's something at the end that kind of keeps it moving forward. So Part of this is talk, we teaching teach our kids them. and then and yeah. teaching them and then involving them in deciding what the motivation should be. And we there's a whole other thing around consequences and agreements and things like that. You definitely want to always involve your kids in setting the consequences, setting what the rewards are. I mean, it's just this reminder that you want to involve them in the process. Yeah, right. Collaboration is key. And yeah. right now we're talking about, so if you want to help your kid find a motivation to do something, you want to 
focus on buy-in, agenda, agency, all that stuff. And there are five key motivators for the kids in our realm whose brains are impacted by executive function. This works for everybody. But some people like Diane have what we call a just get it done button. So she's got this other motivation, which is she's motivated by checking it off a list or getting yeah, it. Done. Well, that's still one of the five technically, but yeah. Yeah. I don't know about that. It doesn't tend to work for this. Those of us neurodivergent folks, you know, if you're one of those people that has to put it on a list to cross, a, cross it off, right. That it, then it might be a good motivator for you. Right. But so the five key motivators you can remember by the acronym pinch. P-I-N-C-H, pinch, pinch me. I'm dreaming. I can get this done now, right? Oh, I like that. Yeah. All right. So you want to hear what they are? Okay. Yes, do it. P stands for play. Also, creativity and humor are in this realm. So kids who are motivated by the creativity of something, enjoying something, whether it's putting a basketball hoop on top of the laundry basket so that they can throw in hoops or whether it's dancing or singing their way through their homework um, or maybe bouncing basketballs to do their math problems. Like it might be the kind of kid who loves to, you know, loves to pick folders that are different colors and have an organization system that's really fun and creative and colorful. Um, so creativity is, it comes into this. Right. Or you want to write it out, whatever. So play, creativity, and humor are all in that place. So humor, a lot of us use humor to kind of dance with our kids around these issues and humor can be really powerful. I stands for interest. This is a kid who's interested. And if you've ever heard yourself say he only does, she only does what she's interested in, what she wants to do. That's a kid who tends to be interested in in motivated by interest interest and that it's school that could be interested in a teacher or it could be interested in the subject right or it could be interested in the social of school like your son used to get to school early because that's when his social time was yeah right? exactly yeah so it could be a lot of different things but it's it's the if you're motivated by it's got to be compelling to me it's got to be interesting to me then that's a really great motivator and the third one is N, which is novelty, which is new and different. Shiny, shiny object syndrome, or steroids, right? Um, my favorite example that people love when I talk about this is that I have, and this is not an ex- exaggeration, I have three toothpastes and at least two or three different toothbrushes in my sink, in my drawer, in my sink. Because every night it's a kind of roulette of which toothpaste am I going to choose? And am I in the mood for charcoal tonight or do I want the, want the minty tonight? Um, and that keeps it novel for me, right? It keeps it changing. So even if I have a system that really, really works, I may get bored with it and I need to change it up and I might need to create a new system because I like novelty. Well, so these are the, people ex- who are really motivated at the beginning. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Year, yeah. Right. But they may start waning about two thirds halfway through the semester. My son would come to me and say, I'm done. And I'd say, you made it a month longer than last year. Way to go. Because he's a real novelty seeker. Right. And they do much better when they move into a a higher level of learning where the classes are changing and the teachers are changing and they change classes each semester. Some of those kids actually do better, even though it's more executive function, because there's more novelty going on. Right. Right. So the C stands for a couple of things. It stands for competition. It stands for connection. It stands for collaboration. Collaboration, right? right? So it may be about competition with themselves. And like, I'm going to beat my last, you know, my personal my kids, record. I would say, yeah. say, see how fast you can get upstairs and get your shoes and come back downstairs. Right. So that would be a competition sort of thing with themselves. Or, um, you know, a lot of times in schools, they'll use timers or they'll use, gamification as a way to kind of get these kids engaged and involved. So and if you have an athlete, a lot of times kids who are working towards their a PR for something, a personal record on whatever they're competing yeah. in can, can yeah. really show up. You've got to be careful with competition because if you have a kid who's anxious, it may actually shut them down because they feel the more pressure from yeah. competition. And so a kid with anxiety might be more focused on um, collaboration, like working with other people. There's a lot of times in school environments, they'll have 
uh, kids work together to create a project or work, you know, and, and so working groups, working yeah. in groups, I mean, and, and modifying that and making that at home, you know, it's like this sort of let's work together. I'm going to, I'm going to do my home. I remember when I was a kid, my mom would write letters when I was doing my homework and it was like this, we call it body doubling, but it's like, we were working together and it felt like this sort of connection and collaboration, even though we were working on parallel things, it was motivating because I wasn't like sitting in my room doing it all by myself. I really liked that connection piece of it. Yeah. Or study groups or, yeah, I mean, it can show up a lot of ways. So connection uh, and, and or competition is what shows up in the C. And then H is hurry up or urgency. And that's actually, it's really interesting because what what's happening there is you're relying on a different part of your brain to get it done. You're relying on the amygdala to kind of click in and say it's last minute. I got to get it done now. Now we've got some different hormones that are coursing through your brain. You got a little cortisol going. And so if you've ever had a kid who's waited to the last minute to do anything, there's often a chance that they're using hurry up or urgency as a motivation to get it done. And it can be really frustrating because you can see that they could have, if they had planned it out, they would have done a much better job. And that's true. But by waiting to the last minute, they've got a different something that's activating the frontal lobe of their brain to get them to do the work that needs to be done. And the maddening thing is sometimes they do an equally good job at the last minute. So it's really hard to teach them how to plan it out because they actually did well on it. Right, right. And so part of it is is seeing the role that, hurry up can play and the urgency isn't a isn't a bad guy and it's often it's often stress producing what particularly for us is we're watching our kids wait till the last minute and and we're feeling the stress of it yeah exactly so so what i want to say there is that we want we don't want to demonize hurry up or urgency it's a it's a very valuable tool we just don't want it to be their only tool in their toolbox Right. We want to teach them all these other motivators so that they can use it selectively instead of having it be the only thing that works for them. Well, and the other side of hurry up, which we didn't really talk about, is is fear based motivation. And Mm. a lot of times what happens is that this sort of I got to do this because I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to I got to do this or I'm going to lose my phone. I got to do this or I'm like it's a sort of there's a fear that's in there. And again, it's a sort of my kid will only do it if I threaten to take away their phone. Okay, so that means you're you're using motivator that's urgency. Again, you're back in the amygdala, you're triggering your kids' fears. It doesn't mean it doesn't work, but it does mean that you're it's not sustainable. It's exhausting. Right. I mean, how many adults do you know that are constantly beating themselves up to try to get them to do stuff? And and well, and the problem is that it works. Yeah. Right. But but it doesn't, it's not a healthy process of getting ourselves to do things. And it's, and over so, time it's exhausting. Well, and it wears out your adrenals and it can become a health issue. Like it can actually become unhealthy. So, so those are the five motivators pinch. We encourage you, invite you, urge you to teach them to your kids. No matter how old your kids are, you can all, whatever age you can start asking, well, what do you think was the motivation for doing that? And you can share pinch and you can just get curious about what does and doesn't motivate people. My favorite motivation story was I needed my kids to go to the grocery store. We had had a death in the family and my oldest was 18 and I, you know, they didn't want to go and I didn't blame them for wanting to not wanting to, but I kind of needed them out of the house for a minute so we could have some adult conversation. And so my eldest looked at their siblings and paused and looked back at me and I could tell that they wanted to help me out here, mom. You know, they wanted to. And so they looked at their sibs and they said, OK, everybody superheroes to the grocery store and they put on capes and tights over and shorts over the tights and they dressed up and made it fun and playful and creative and new and novel and interesting so that they could get themselves out the door and go to the grocery store. So using the motivation, whatever is available, but really using it consciously. Well, and so there's so much in here. So take a minute before we close off and really reflect on all the different pieces we talked about with motivation. Maybe go back and listen to this another time yeah. if you want to. So pinch is great, but what about the first half, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which was really the that? role that motivation plays is yes, don't just focus on the pinch, but focus on what is the role of motivation. But so so jot some notes for yourself, reflect on our conversation today. What were your ahas from what we talked about before we close off? Right. And as you wrap end. up this conversation. What's motivating you to take that, to do that aha, to take that information and put it into action? 
What do you want to do with it? Where do you want to take it? And maybe how will you set yourself up for success with that? So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Elaine. Always. It was a pleasure. All right. Go forth and, and find your motivation. Help your kids, invite them to, and know that, that um, we're glad you're motivated to be tuning in to our podcast. And we will see you on the next one. Thanks, Take everybody. care, everybody. You've been listening to the Parenting with Impact podcast with Elaine and Diane. For more information on the Impact Parents community or to join Sanity School for Parents, please visit impactparents.com. If you like what you've heard, please share this podcast with friends who need similar guidance and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the essentials of Elaine and Diane's coach approach to parenting, download a free tip sheet at impactparents.com slash podcast. Behavior therapy training for parents is actually recommended as a first-line treatment for complex kids. For information about Sanity School, our training program for parents or teachers, which has helped thousands of families around the globe, visit impactparents.com slash sanity school.